Today we've got a great time theft malicious compliance story. We'll get to that in a bit, but first, job description is a B. I had worked as a soloist, cantor, and song leader in a Catholic church for six years without a raise. During that time, I trained the pianist, the pastor hated organs, in how to play and support the congregation during the mass. She was a brilliant accompanist from Russia and had no experience with Roman Catholic liturgy. We shared enough English, German, and Italian to be able to communicate well. I also trained new song leaders and cantors, coached all the cantors and the pianist in psalmody. I composed and arranged music to fit the specific congregation, filled in for the music coordinator who lived about a four hours drive away. In short, I went way above and beyond my job description, all for the same amount I'd initially negotiated at my hiring. I should pause and describe my qualifications. At that time, I was singing in the opera chorus at the San Francisco Opera, had my own voice studio, 15 years experience teaching preschool through community college, was on the faculty of my diocesan group that trained cantors, lectors, Eucharistic ministers, and other lay ministers. I was the liturgist for the Religious Education Commission for the southern part of the diocese. I'd been choir director and liturgy coordinator for the largest parish in the country. I was trained by some of the top liturgists, musicians, and educators in the country, so I was more than qualified. After six years of good and faithful service, I found myself in a situation where I needed more income. So I asked the music coordinator for a raise, and he told me I had to talk to the pastor. I called to make an appointment with the pastor, but he was never available. One day, I bumped into him at the local grocery store and cornered him to ask about a raise. He said I had to make an appointment. I told him I kept trying to make one, but he was never available. I asked him point blank if he was ever going to be available to make an appointment. He bluntly replied, not for me, then he turned and left. The next day, I went into the church office and told the parish secretary and other staff members that I was going to fulfill my exact job description and sing the music assigned to me by the music coordinator. Nothing more and nothing less. Later that week, we started rehearsals for the upcoming Christmas season. Amongst the pieces that they passed out were several mass parts that I'd set to Christmas carols. I collected all of the copies that they had and informed them with apologies, but I owned the copyrights to those arrangements and I was withdrawing permission for the parish to use them, and they needed to choose different music. They asked me for suggestions, but I told them that wasn't my job, and they needed to ask the music coordinator, but they said he isn't available, so we'll just go ahead with my arrangements. I reluctantly stated that if I learned that they were using my music without my written permission, that I would report them for copyright violations, and the parish would be held accountable for every unauthorized copy found in their possession. A couple of weeks later, on the Sunday closest to the celebration of Our Lady of Guadalupe, the members of the Guadalupana Society would come in and sing the traditional Guadalupana songs. So when they got up at mass to sing their songs, I sat down because it wasn't in my job description. The parish secretary was very upset and said that shouldn't count. I said it was the very thing that was not in my job description and if she wanted it changed, she would have to take it up with the pastor. I never did get the raise, and a couple of months later I was eased out of the job entirely. I encountered some of the parishioners who said they had left the parish when they found out I was no longer there, and they took their generous donations with them. The pianist I had trained later found out she was in over her head when several challenges arose that needed a person with background and liturgical training to solve, so she quit. Honestly, it boils down to OP knowing their worth to these people, when they turned down the raise, it really helped shine a light on what OP was doing far beyond their job description. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you enjoy awesome stories of malicious compliance, why not hit that subscribe button down below? That said, our next story is, don't care about people calling me on your old number? I'll sort it. This was about 10 years ago. I had just moved to Australia and gotten a new phone, but as it turns out, my number was someone else's old number. Every other week I'd get calls by a tradie who wanted to know why I wasn't on site mate or what I wanted done with building project ABC. Every time I explained at length that they got the wrong number and quite often folks on the other end were absolutely rude or thought I was taking the piss and insist I answered their questions or showed up on site now. I was over it. So I googled my own number and did some digging and eventually found out the guy who had my number before, then his new number, and then I called him. I politely explained my dilemma, 
pointed out that there were two websites still having his old, my now new, number, and if he could please change this and let his contacts know about his new number and to delete the old one, as it was getting quite tedious for me. By that time, I'd used my new number for work, visa applications, and landlords and friends, and changing it would have been a huge pain. I explained all of that, while of course he was just as pleasant as most of his contacts, and told me something along the lines of, I don't give a freak mate, that's not my freaking problem, get freaked, sort your own stuff out mate. Well, the universe provides and so I got a great opportunity to do just that only a few weeks later. I received a call in the early hours of one morning by another disgruntled guy telling me he was early and demanding to know where I wanted the sand put down and how to get in. I asked what sand and was told he had a full truckload of sand as ordered and no one was on site and it was all fenced off. Very briefly did I think about launching into my explanation but I was tired and over it and then realized the opportunity provided. I snapped back at him with no uncertainty. mate. It's all good, dump it all right in the driveway, front of the fence. We'll sort it out when we get there. The guy said, you sure mate? It's a lot of sand. I say, absolutely sure mate, thanks a lot. He says, all right then boss, and hangs up. Well, I go back to bed, snoozing for another hour with a big smile until my phone rings again, and I see it's old mate with his new number who I'd saved when I called him a few weeks ago. I pick up rather chipper and he doesn't waste any time launching into a series of swear words and how he has no access to the site and that he has to move a literal ton of sand by hand and whether or not I told the sand guy to dump it all there. I replied, you told me to sort this out myself, this is me sorting this out. You can remove the numbers and let your contacts know or not, totally up to you, mate. He was fuming, called me a few more choice words, promising to find me and a lot more before we ended the conversation. However, the numbers disappeared from the internet really quickly after that, and I never got a call again. I still have my number, and every time I see a truck with sand, I chuckle to myself thinking of this guy moving a ton of sand by hand and losing a fair few hours of labor because he was a jerk and couldn't be bothered sending a few texts. This guy made it so easy for OP to do what they did. This guy was so belligerent, just immediately going to, I don't freaking care, get freaked. Makes it so satisfying to get that sand dumped there. Our next story is, don't get in my way if you know what's good for you. Sir, yes sir. My grandfather fought in the Second World War, and it was at once the best and worst of times for him. He didn't like speaking about it, thinking about it, and particularly didn't like that any of us grandkids were interested in his experience. But every now and again he'd dine to tell us a few stories about it. I can't speak to the veracity of them, but a few other people I've talked to whose grandparents served in the same theater all recognize the stories as familiar. In this case, it was D-Day. Grandpa, Dave, was one of the units of infantry set to be on the first wave of landing boats arriving on the beach. They'd all been told what to expect and knew it would be an awful meat grinder, but still had the hope that the attack would be enough of a surprise that the grand plan of securing the literal beachhead would help the allies win the war against the enemy regime. So they were all ready to go, all loaded up just waiting for the final signal to be passed down. Dave was generally friends with the rest of his unit and had a good commanding officer, but all the CEOs were being given final orders, which left the antagonist of our story, a man I'm calling Fred because I don't know his actual name, time to come over and harass the unit. Fred was fairly up the rank chain, below general but someone who had command or at least the ear of command and had sent units off on missions. As my grandpa Dave alleged, Fred hated Canadian troops for their glory-stealing ways, which is to say that Fred's grandfather had gotten upshone by Canadians at Vimy Ridge in World War I, and he'd hated Canadians all his life. Within what was allowed by his authority as an American army officer, he always assigned Canadians to the worst and most lethal assignments, and today would be no different. A few years back, he'd been involved in assigning units to a highly secretive raid on a coastal port known as Dieppe, and prior to that he'd been involved in just a lot of general crap stirring, and my grandpa had stood up to him on more than one occasion, which had earned him Fred's personal enmity, so Fred came over to gloat about how likely Grandpa Dave and his unit were to die in the soon-to-commence offensive, 
and how he'd almost miss seeing their sorry faces and blah blah blah, and just doing everything he could to needle them with the hopes that one would finally, finally make that fatal error of assaulting a superior officer. When it became clear that they weren't going to do that, he resorted to threats, telling them they'd better stay out of his way because this offensive would finally bring his family the glory they'd been denied in the previous world war, and then he commandeered the unit's GPA. For reference, that's an amphibian quarter-ton 4x4 jeep, and pronounced his ambition. Fred was going to be the first member of the Allied forces to set foot on the beaches of Normandy. He would enter the history books and world history, elevating his family's glory to never-before-seen heights. All he had to do was race out ahead of the landing boats. He was prepared to. He knew he'd get shot at, so he was wearing some fancy armor inserts he'd bought that would guarantee his survival against anything short of a machine gun emplacement. Then the order came down the lines, and that brought what I can best describe as equal parts malicious compliance and letting someone hang themselves with enough rope. The unit's commanding officer came back, realized the GPA was gone, and demanded to know where it was. So they just told him one of the Americans had commandeered it, but not who. So Grandpa Dave's commanding officer rode with the infantry instead, grumbling all the while. The landing boats all launched and began making their way to the beach. Each invasion force was arriving through a hole in the mine net that protected the beaches. The mines having had their tethers cut and left to drift away on outgoing currents the day previous. But mine laying and mine sweeping are tricky work. And in more than one case, sea mines had been laid too close to one another and had detonated, especially as the Axis forces determined the optimal placement for their naval mines. Fred ordered Grandpa Dave not to get in his way. The malicious compliance essentially boils down to this. Neither Grandpa Dave nor his unit told anyone that Fred specifically had commandeered the GPA, nor that he planned to range out in front of the invasion force to be the first man on the beach. So Fred did exactly that. He ordered his driver to range out in front of the troop ships, racing across the surf towards the beach, all ready to step out of the jeep and into the history books, the landing ships directly behind him. Amphibious jeeps like the GPA had issues. And one of the issues was that they were very heavy for their displacement, which meant that they could only handle shallow water. Fred was fine driving across the surf, but then Fred hit the crater left by a naval mine detonation. The entire jeep submerged, dropping down into the depression and stalling its forward motion. And then the landing ship directly behind Fred's jeep kept going, went straight over the poor schmuck and his unlucky driver. Fred was not the first man to set foot on the beach that day, and he didn't step out of his jeep and into history, but he certainly stepped into family legend. His own worst enemy was his own ego, and if he hadn't made an enemy out of my grandpa's unit, they would have told their CO the full details, and their commanding officer would have gone and chewed out Fred and gotten the GPA back, and Fred would have lived to see the end of the war. It's at this part of the retelling Grandpa Dave would get pretty somber. Yeah, he had it coming, but nobody deserves to die like that, he'd say. I once asked him if he could do it over, would he tell his commanding officer the full details? Absolutely, he replied. That poor driver. All you can say about that is that is a brutal turn of events. I mean, the whole situation of Normandy and D-Day is brutal enough as it is, but just imagine trying to race out there and be first to gloat, and you just end up getting run over by your own ships before you even get there. Our next story is classic time theft. After working at McDonald's a few weeks, I'm put on the closing shift with another co-worker and a manager, a pushover kid and a selfish adult. After the store closes, there's about minutes of work left before we can leave. This includes waiting for the computer system to run its stuff and the manager to log it. To do that, the workers need to be clocked out, which usually happens after our work is done. But this manager had been clocking out the workers while they were still working so they can finish faster. I noticed the computers turned off while mopping the floor and asked if she clocked us out. She said yes and tried to make it sound like she was doing us a favor by getting us home early. I have no idea how long this had been going on. The other kid had been doing this for a while. I said, I guess I'm done working and dropped my mop to sit in the lobby and wait for the paperwork to finish. It took a minute, but eventually the other kid realized what was right and joined me in the lobby. 
The manager did try and complain higher up, but was obviously told she was wrong. I wasn't put on night shift anymore, and I hope that other kid stopped putting up with her BS. Honestly, if she tried to complain to higher ups about this, she deserves to get fired. She literally reported herself for time theft. I mean, OP should report this to actual authorities. They want us to pay the tax on our hotels. We started checking out over 30 days. So this has multiple layers. Follow me on this journey. So I work for a defense contractor. It's one of the big three. We're based in Guam, but in Florida for training until the summer. We're all in hotels and here we are a few months into our trip and all of a sudden the person doing our expense reports keeps kicking them back. Now we're incurring late fees which we all refuse to pay. She's saying that after 30 days we're responsible for the tax on the rooms which is $13 a day, almost $400 a month. In our contract, the company has stated that they'll pay for a trip to our home of record once a month, which none of us have been doing because we've been so busy. Here comes the malicious compliance. Now we're all scheduling trips home each month to break up the 30 days so we don't pay the tax on the hotel, while the company is now paying for flights to our homes of record. One guy's from Guam, and his tickets are almost $2,000 for round trip, so now it's costing them another $700 to $2,000 for flights each month. In another instance, years ago coming home from Japan, my flight had an 8-hour layover in Tokyo. I found a flight that was shorter but cost $200 more. They rejected it because it wasn't the lowest fare available. I'm paid doorstep to doorstep when I travel, meaning I'm on the clock from when I leave my house until I get to my hotel at my final destination. Many of these travel days end up being around 23 hours. I thought the company would be cool with me saving them 8 hours of me on the clock, but nope. Okay then, 13 hours of double time at $100 an hour? So $1,300 over a $200 price difference. The people who write these contracts really don't think crap through. I think the bottom line from all of the stories you hear like this is just be fair to your workers or the people you're paying or expecting money from. All of these dumb penny-pinching policies are put in place and all it does is fuel all these people to find the most efficient way to just totally tear it apart. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you enjoy awesome stories of malicious compliance, why not hit that subscribe button down below? That said, our next story is Malicious Compliance, Bossy Big Sister Edition. When my sister and I were teenagers, she liked to boss me around because she was older. She was always ordering me to do things or get things for her. Several times a day, it was water. Give me a glass of ice water. Our folks often had parties, and occasionally that meant lots of crushed ice left over the next day. On one of those days that there was a lot of crushed ice in the freezer, she made her usual demand. I brought her a glass with one tiny ice cube and a tiny bit of water. She yelled at me to go get her a glass of ice water, and it better be full with lots of ice. Yeah, I was ready for that. I rammed as much crushed ice as I could fit in the glass and just enough water to melt it and freeze together. I took it to her and got rewarded with seeing her try to drink the water, tipping the glass almost upside down and barely getting a mouthful. She screamed at me while I laughed. This next story is attendance policy. I've been working for a small railroad company for almost five years and they recently updated the attendance policy for being late. If you are even one minute late, you will be charged half a sick day. If you are any more than two hours late, you're charged a full sick day. One day while headed to work, I called ahead and informed my train master that I was going to be five minutes late due to a major traffic accident. Because of the new policy, he was going to charge me half a sick day. I argued that I'd never been late before and that I should be exempt for calling ahead for a mere five minutes. The stubborn train master was not persuaded and insisted he was going to charge me half a sick day. My response? Okay, I'll be there in two hours. Good on OP because they're going to try to bully you and then still expect you to show up. Nah, it doesn't work like that. You don't get free work from me. Our next story is travel policy unintended consequences. I worked in a Fortune 100 company and a lower level management position but was actively local in a well-regarded professional association outside of work hours. The professional association folks liked my contributions and over a few years nominated me for higher and higher visibility roles. Eventually, I was nominated for a prestigious global role that required travel to planning meetings and conferences. 
Before accepting the nomination, I checked with my management. All the way up the chain, they were delighted that someone from their organization had received this recognition. I pointed out in writing that some days per year would be required to participate, no problem, and that some travel, potentially international travel, would also be required. No problem either, but the professional organization would pay for the latter. Okay, time for a planning meeting. This one was near one of the company's international offices, no fuss. After a week's company visit, I just took a train from that city to the planning meeting, spent the weekend, and went to meetings at the company site. Train fare was pretty cheap, I didn't even file an expense report, and the professional association had already reserved and paid for the hotel room and arranged for all meals at the planning meeting. Then the annual conference. It was to occur on a continent, country, and city with no local company office or any office within a few thousand miles. I notify my management of the date, duration, and that the association will pick up travel expenses. I quickly hear back that, by company policy, the travel must be paid for by the company and not the association, to eliminate even the whiff of conflict of interest. And since it was on another continent, corporate policy required that the travel be business or first class. From my home airport to that city, no business class was available, travel not approved. I offered my senior management the opportunity to edit the letter I would write to the head of the professional association, regretting that my company's travel policy would prevent me from attending the conference, and that as a result, it would make sense for me to resign this prestigious position. First class travel approved. You gotta stick to that policy all until it makes a big stink. All of a sudden, you can make an exception. Our next story is, size doesn't matter. This happened about five years ago and I was just reminded of it today. I thought that I'd share. The cafe near an old job used to sell overpriced 12 ounce drinks. The location was convenient so I usually bought from there anyways. One week they ran out of 12 ounce cups and started using 8 ounce cups instead. I asked for a discount but was told the size of the cup didn't matter as long as it was filled to the top. Q compliance. I bought a 32 ounce ceramic cup and brought it in the next day. After purchasing the drink, I gave the barista the cup. He looked at me, looked at the cup, and stared at me straight in the eyes for 30 seconds. Then he filled the cup to the top and gave it back to me without saying a word. The next day, the 12 ounce cups were back. Honestly, this is just a consequence of most of the price of a fountain drink being in the cup, not actually the drink itself. This next story is expecting me to work two hours a day for free. I worked in a 40 hour 8 to 5 job where I was looked badly at if I left the office at 6 since that was the latest I could pick my son up from daycare. When I informed them that I was pregnant with my second child, I requested that upon returning from maternity leave, I would need a schedule working from 30 hours from the office and 10 from home. If this wasn't doable for them, I would resign at the end of my pregnancy and not accept maternity benefits from them. Where I live, if you accept maternity leave, you are then tied to the company for six months upon returning to work. The company had too much turnover of staff and was finding it extremely difficult to employ new people, as it was steadily gaining a reputation for how staff is treated, so they accept it. One week before ending my maternity, I'm called in by HR to sign an agreement stating that in order to be able to work 10 hours from home, I was then required to work an additional 10 hours a week on call over and above the 40 hours. When asked if I would be reimbursed for that time, they said that I would receive a 20 euro allowance per month to cover using my phone during those 10 hours. Needless to say, I refused the agreement and the phone allowance and told them that from that day onwards, unless they paid me overtime rates, I wouldn't stay a minute after my time and would disconnect on anyone who called me work-related on my phone. If they wanted me to be available on the phone, they had to provide one even during work hours when I was working out of the office. I ended up making much more money because I then claimed every minute of overtime. Needless to say, on the fifth month of returning from maternity leave, I informed them that the day my six months tied to the company was over, I was resigning at the busiest time of year for the business. Our next story is furlough? Okay, if you want. I worked for a very large Fortune 100 company a few years ago. Our division was in a particular industry that was linked to oil and gas. So when oil prices declined, our revenues declined. There was no demand for our products because there was no investment in the market segment. There was literally nothing we could do. 
If no one was building oil refineries, no one was buying our tech, no matter how good or a bad job we did. About seven to eight years ago, the market was way down. We were very lean and our industry very profitable. So we still made excellent margins, but sales were down, so our profits were down. I think we had a target of about $925 million in profit for our division, and we were on track to make maybe $850 million, still wildly profitable. However, the corporate office was pissed about the missing $75 million. Go find a way to bridge the gap. One of the things they did to make up some of the lost profit was to cut everyone's paycheck by 10%, and then tell us to work 10% fewer hours. 36 hour work week instead of 40. This sucked, but they instituted it in late spring, and we did summer hours every summer where you'd work 9 hour days Monday to Thursday, and then half a day on Friday. So what it really meant was you worked 9 hours Monday to Thursday, and took your furlough Friday, so the pay cut stung a little, but you essentially got a 3 day weekend every week, which made it a little better. What they didn't consider though was human nature. We were in a highly specialized industry, with a ton of very educated, talented, dedicated scientists and engineers. And I was a dweeb finance person. Most of these people lived in the office. No one worked a 40 hour work week. 50 hours was the norm. And plenty of people worked more. People didn't care because they were devoted to work that was interesting, and we were generally pretty fairly paid. However, cut their paychecks and everyone says screw you you only get my 36 hours now i was in a meeting the first month after the policy took place and the ceo and cfo were in disbelief that our billable hours had fallen by more than 30 percent not 10 percent as expected yes we got paid by the hour worked because we charged for engineering time not just for products so i had the distinct pleasure of explaining to the executives that yes you only cut people's pay in hours by 10%, but guess what? Everyone quit working unpaid overtime and only worked 36 hours to the minute. And anytime something happened on a Friday, sorry, there's no one here to help. But it gets worse. All summer, most people were pretty content to enjoy the shortened schedule. But come September, summer hours end and everyone's back in the office five days a week and leaving after lunch on Friday. Plus, for the older people, the company had a generous pension plan that paid something like 80% pay after you hit retirement age. So a lot of these people decided retiring for 80% was better than working for 90% and retired. Tons of others left. The company lost literally centuries of highly specialized knowledge and experience, walking out the door, and because it was specialized, it was very, very hard to replace. Originally, the program was supposed to save the company $17 million. They lost way, way more than that in lost productivity, lower billings, higher rework, and just lost opportunity. I don't know how it turned out. I left when everyone else did after the summer, but my friends still there tell me the company still hasn't recovered. Well, of course you're going to cut money from the employees. The people at the very top certainly aren't going to take a pay cut. They've got important fingers to point and meetings to be the faces of and stuff. This next story is, Boss says, if you're one minute late, I'm docking 15 minutes from your time. Gets mad when I don't work the 15 minutes I was docked for free. This happened about four years ago. I do construction and we start fairly early. Boss got tired of people walking in at 6.05 or 6.03 when we start at 6 o'clock, even though he was a few minutes late more consistently than any one of us were. So he said, if you aren't standing in front of me at 6 o'clock when we start, then I'm docking 15 minutes from your time for the day. The next day, I accidentally forgot my tape measure in the car and had to walk back across the job site to grab it. Made it inside a few minutes past 6. Boss chewed me out and told me he was serious yesterday and docked me 15 minutes. So I took all my tools off right there and sat down on a bucket. He asked why I wasn't getting to work, and I said I'm not getting paid till 6.15, so I'm not doing any work till 6.15. I enjoy what I do, but I don't do it for free. He tried to argue with me about it until I said, if you're telling me to work without paying me, then that's against the law. You really want to open the company and yourself up to that kind of risk? Maybe I'm the kind of sue, maybe I'm not. But if you keep on telling me to work after you docked my time, then we're gonna find out one way or the other. He shut up pretty quickly after that, and everyone else saw me do it and him cave, so now they weren't gonna take his crap either. 
Over the next few days, guys that would have been one or two minutes late just texted the boss, Hey, sorry boss, would have been there at 6.02 and gotten docked, so I'll see you at 6.15 and I'll get to work then, and then sat in their cars till 6.15 and came in when their time started. So between people doing what I did or just staying in their cars instead, he lost a ton of productivity and morale because he decided that losing 15 minutes of productivity per person and feeling like a big man was better than losing literally one or two minutes of productivity. Even though everyone stands around BSing and getting material together for the day until about 6.10 anyway, after a few weeks of that, he got chewed out by his boss over the loss of productivity and how bad the docked timesheets were looking and reflecting poorly on him as a leader because we were missing deadlines over it, and it showed that he doesn't know how to manage his people. And then suddenly his little self-implemented policy was gone, and we all worked like we were supposed to, and caught back up fairly quickly. Worker solidarity for the win. Not one person took his crap and worked that time for free after he tried to swing his weight around on them. But obviously I was a target after that, and only made it two more months before he had stacked up enough BS reasons to get away with firing me when I called in a few days in a row after my mom fell, and I took off work to take care of her and monitor her for a while during the day. I mean, I don't blame the boss for wanting his guys there on time, but definitely his solution is not the solution. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another absolutely awesome malicious compliance story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.